Welcome back. For today's random project, we're going to be building broadheads. I'm not going to reinvent the wheel since the shape of a broadhead hasn't changed in, you know, a few thousand years. And so I just pulled out some random ones that I had laying around and I'm going to try to steal the, some ideas from them and see what I come up with. This is right now is my favorite broadhead that I, I've, I've been shooting it for a couple years. It's the Cutthroat from Rocky Mountain Specialty Gear. And I really like that it's one piece machined and it, this is a single bevel and it seems to be hold up really well. And so I really like that one. But then we get into these other ones like the Zwickies and you know, we got some Bears in there, some Magnus. And they all seem to do really well. Uh, one thing that I don't like about this dial is that it's pretty much sheet metal that's, you know, clamped down and then spot welded. Not a huge fan of that, but that's a super common style. And then we get over here to these three bladed broadheads and, you know, like the Muzzy Classic. It's right up there with the Classic Thunderhead. Been around forever, killed a lot of animals. Uh, my favorite one for when I'm shooting a pulley bow is uh, this G5 and I like it because it's a it's a one piece it's all machined out so you don't have to worry about it and I couldn't find any other expandables besides this one so this is a terrible example of an expandable broadhead um, but for what I'm doing I'm gonna throw these out I actually super glued these open because I was shooting carp with it so get rid of that one but let's take some measurements on here and see what we got so like this Zwicky I think this is an Eskimo I'm not really sure oh it's about ooh, about an inch and a quarter a little less than an inch and a quarter this one inch and a sixteenth got over here inch and a sixteenth this crazy ooh. That's pretty, somebody got creative with that. Uh, this is another really common broadhead used. Inch and a quarter. So we have all these. This design's been around for a long time. And you see some of them have bleeders, some of them don't. I don't have the machines to be able to put bleeders on there, so we're gonna figure out what we can do without them. So it'll probably just be a two blade. Um, yeah, and then lengthwise, this one's two and a half, this one's right at two inches, this one, two and three quarters, uh, about two and a half, we'll say. This thing's ginormous. I don't know what you'd do with that. It doesn't seem like it'd hold up. But it's it's only two and three quarters so we'll play around with that i didn't want to buy anything new so i just found what i thought was close laying around so i have some 1095 some a2 tool still and an old saw blade to play with So I didn't have a chance to work on this for a couple days, but I decided that these aluminum ones are not the way to go. So now I'm going to go and I'm going to try to make one out of just an old field point. That's actually a new field point. I wouldn't use an old one for this. But, and I think I'm going to make a half dozen of them. So that way I can try to match them and I think if I batch it out, it'll work a little bit better. So we'll go try to turn one of these down a little bit. I'm definitely not a machinist and I didn't set up any tapers or anything, so I'm just kind of pretending that it's an Etch-a-Sketch. So don't take my machining advice.
after cleaning them up and trying to match them, now all of them, they're within a grain. So I'm gonna call that close enough. Instead of doing this the correct way by setting up a slitting saw on a mill, I just created this little jig to cut the, the ferro groove with a, just a porta band. It seemed to work all right. Okay, so I got the first three roughed out. They fit all right. They're not perfect by any means, but I think it's gonna be close enough for me to work with. So we'll just keep playing with them. I'm gonna make some, some bigger ones. So let me show you how I uh, figured out how to draw this. So I pretty much just got a center line, came off of it. These ones are only one inch. These ones are inch and a quarter, so they're quite a bit wider, quarter of an inch. And then I found my three to one ratio, and then I wanted to put a tanto tip, so I figured out where that was. And so now I'll just cut out this part. And so I should still have that ratio that's a mechanical advantage, but it's not as long and, you know, this should work. So now I have them mocked up. You know, they're definitely not perfect at this point. But the plan is, after I get them welded, or, you know, with silver solder, then I left them a little bit big, so that way as I go to balance them and try to hit my weight, I have some extra material to play with. So it's fine that they're not perfect right now, because if any of these get just a little bit off when I'm soldering them together, then I'll, I'll have extra material to take off and, and even it up. So this is what they look like after they're soldered. You can see some of them have pretty good weld joints. Some of them not so much. Some of them are they're not perfectly straight, but that's okay. So I'm just gonna hit them with a wire brush, try to clean them up.
So now I have two sets of broadheads, two sets of three. One of one set's about 250 grains, the other set's about 290. And you might think that that's a lot, but this cutthroat that I've been shooting is a 200. Plus I've been shooting with a 100 grain brass insert. And so if I use an aluminum, like 15 grain insert with, with either of these, we'll just see which one tunes better. I think that they're gonna be all right. Um, cost, I have about maybe less than $3 in each one of these. So they're really cheap and we'll see how they hold up. So if you're interested, hold on and I'll show you testing these broadheads. Um, the other thing is I have an idea on how to make them look more professional, make them look a little bit better. So you can also hang out for that for a minute. See if this makes them look any better. Nope, still look homemade. Well, let me tell you a story. So, just like a lot of weekends, I got out of work as quick as I could just to drive across the good old land of entrapment. If any of you have ever driven across New Mexico, you know that it's, if you stay on the interstates, it's pretty boring. So, about 50 podcasts about how you can kill a 200 inch mule deer or a 400 inch bull behind any tree and it's easy to get tags. I finally made it to where I was going to go hunting. I went to a new spot I'd never been before and after a little while I finally found what I was looking for. Nope, not those. Not that either. And Well, maybe those. But not that what I was looking for. And then finally I found one. The elusive collared peccary. So most people wouldn't drive across the state to hunt, you know, javelina, but I did. And so I came across this small little group and one of them broke off. I spooked them and I snuck into about 50 yards and I was going to try this call that I just got. And, you know, I'd seen a lot of videos and I heard a lot about people calling javelina. And so I blew on it a little bit and sure enough, Kind of gave me a second look and then it was gone. And I was in this little draw and there was Havelina sign, but I didn't, I couldn't find him. And I decide, last ditch effort, I'm gonna start blowing on this call. So I start blowing and I'm just standing there. I don't have an arrow knocked. Like I still have a backpack on, just looking around, daydreaming, thinking about other areas I'm gonna go check. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, these javelinas show up about 25 yards away. And so then I'm in panic mode. And I'm trying to get an arrow knocked and, you know, everything lined up. And they win me. And about the time that they win me and start taking off, then right around the bush from me comes this javelina with its hackles up and it's woofing. Uh, it's going, hoo, hoo, hoo. and then there's a little one behind it. And about, that's about the time I got an arrow knocked and I flung an arrow and it was about half a mile behind it. But that was really exciting for a minute. And I thought I was gonna have to, you know, kick it in the face or something to get away. It was right there, real quick. So I kept, you know, kept hunting and finally I, I you know, I'd chase them around, I'd glass them up and, you know, did my thing and I come around and I find some and I sneak up on them and as you know javelina are a traditional bow hunter's dream because they're pretty easy to sneak up on and so I sneak up on them and sure enough I miss and so I try to call and I you know the call did work but they had a pretty strong breeze and so they kind of came around downwind from me and blew out and I couldn't get another shot so it was about time for me to go try somewhere else and I actually ran out of time. And so I had to come home and go to work and then 
the next weekend I did it all over again. I drove all the way 400 miles across the state just for a javelina. And I got into a few, nothing too special. They're, they hide really well, really better than you would expect. And usually you don't find javelina as easy when you're looking for them, but if you're deer hunting or quail hunting or ibex hunting or whatever else kind of hunting you're doing, you run into them all the time. But they blend in really well. So I find this spot and I see something moving and I can't pick it out. So I have my 10 power binoculars and then I switch to my bigger binoculars on a tripod and I'm looking and looking and I can't seem to find it. And so I, you know, start second guessing myself. There are some cattle in there. I thought maybe it was a calf or something. So I left all my stuff and I go for a little hike over there. And sure enough, I see this javelina with his head in a bush eating. So I sneak up more like I walked up on it because it was straight away. The wind was blowing perfect and get within range and then a little bit closer and I shoot and I miss. And then I shoot again and I hit it. Not great. And it didn't know what was happening. It actually came closer to me. And so there were some arrows flying and stuff like that. But it uh, eventually ended up getting it. And now you know the story. These broadheads seemed to work great. My shooting was not good, but it worked. So I tested these broadheads a little bit at home and they held up just fine, just like any other broadheads would. And the reason why I chose Havelina to test, or not to test them, to use them on, is because this is the only tag that I have left for the year. So it seemed to work flawless, you know, pass through, except on my follow-up shot, the only reason why I didn't pass through was because it's stuck in the dirt or in the sand on the other side. So that worked great. Um, the bow I'm using is one that I made. I made the quiver. I made the knife that I'm gonna skin it with. So the only thing left that I need to make are arrow shafts. So keep a lookout for those. Other than that, hopefully you can go make some on your own and have a good time. Oh, question, would I use these on elk or deer? I definitely use them on deer. I think I need to change the design just a little bit for uh, elk. And I'm not saying these are as good as, uh, you know, Iron Will or, you know, those Grizzly Stick, anything like that. So, just keep that in mind, but they definitely do the job.